All right. Thank you everyone for joining, uh, no matter where you are. And apparently the world, Trinidad and Tobago is uh, <laughs> attending, which is very cool. Um, this webinar is in response to the documentary Untouchable, um, which was showed over the weekend. We had a free screening. It is still available if anybody wants to catch it online. There are um, a couple of streaming services. If you go to untouchablefilms.com, you can see where it's made available. Um, the talk back is not specifically about the movie, but it's about the topic that the movie is um, focused on, which is about the sex offense registry in general. But I think in the greater scheme of things, it's about a type of policies and a culture that we have that emphasizes punishment, isolation, and a black and white view of things and how to approach instead of accountability, genuine accountability, healing, and problem solving. So we're going to talk about those topics along with the movie throughout the course of this panel. We have three you know, fantastic people who I'm very, very grateful for for uh, joining us to talk about how their understanding can bring some you know, clarity to this situation and this um, issue. Uh, before I introduce the panel, I want to talk about a couple other events we have coming up. We have two more in this series. Uh, one will be focused on employers and people in the housing space regarding uh, people on the registry and how they, um, they're specifically in Wisconsin, but it'll be relevant to anybody across the country, talking about uh, people that have hired people that are on the registry and giving their testimony about that experience and why it's something that they should be embracing and they shouldn't be running from, um, how to do that. Maybe there are some liability issues that you have to worry about, but talking about it from the employer and the landlord side um, is going to be our next one. We had that scheduled for next week. I scheduled for Valentine's Day at first, so I'm going to have to reschedule that one. So uh, if you want to email us, I'm going to put our information in the chat. Uh, you can ask us when those will be coming up. We'll keep you informed. The one after that will then be about um, support groups and law changes and things for those that are actually on the registry to come and find out what's going on and what's available to them, as well as how to form what are known as fearless groups, which NARSAL has been putting together, where people that are um, affected by the smokes can help each other out and share best practices, which places do rent, which places do hire, but maybe don't make it public. So those are two events we're going to have to continue the series. And then more immediately on Thursday, um, our organization, the community, is doing a uh, panel with a group of fantastic women in the Bay Area about um, intimate partner violence and community accountability. So I'm going to post that in the chat as well, uh, the link to that. And um, yeah, so if you want to follow us, my name is Shannon Ross. I am the executive director and founder of the community, the organization that is partnering for that panel and has kind of put this together. Um, and I will go into the introductions of our wonderful panel. I'm um, gonna keep that short because we wanna kind of get into the topic. First, we will have um, Amber Vlangis, who is the executive director of Restorative Action Alliance, um, also a veteran and a sexual crime survivor. We have Eric, Eric Janis, who is the president and Dean Emer Emeritus. Emeritus. I actually don't know how to pronounce it. Emeritus. What is it? Emeritus. 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 Okay. Yeah, I'm not ashamed to say I don't know how to pronounce it. I want to make sure I know how to pronounce it. Emeritus. <laughs> uh, President Dean Emeritus of Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. Um, I actually know a couple of people that have graduated from there. Current friend of mine, uh, David Carlson. Uh, also named the 25 most influential people of legal education in 2015 and 2016. And lastly, we have uh, Robert Peterson. Uh, he will show up hopefully soon. Owner of Custom Finished Wood Flooring. Uh, he's also been on the registry for 20 years for a crime that is no longer actually a crime. So I want to start out with what I think is oftentimes in this work in reentry reform and um, just the area of decarceration. We oftentimes forget about that at the beginning of this, there's actually a crime that's committed and somebody has been hurt. And we overlook, I feel a lot of times, crime survivors and we focus on those that are formerly and currently incarcerated. So I always like to start out with and anything we do the voice and the opinion of people who have been on that side of it. So with that, um, thank you very much, Amber, for joining us. And uh, the first question I want to ask is what got you into this work? So um, first of all, I really appreciate, you know, being invited to participate in this panel. I think this is a really good um, conversation around a really good piece of work and um, the conversations that we really should be having. So I mean, I come to this work as um, a person who experienced a military sexual assault. So um, as an 18-year-old young Marine, 
I did um, experience a, a rape by another uh, member of our unit. And, um, you know, that is something that really changed my life. Obviously, harm was caused. It was in a set in, setting that um, did not at the time have a lot of things in place to handle sexual violence, um, even though it was very common. So, so that's kind of my experience coming into the idea that, you know, this harm was out there in the world. Um, it changed my whole perspective on myself and what it meant to be safe. Um, and it, it really kind of flips your world upside down. You um, may act in ways that you typically wouldn't act. Um, and the, the world just feels completely different to you. Um, you know, at the time uh, of that I experienced this, uh, you know, there was a lot of a culture of, well, what did you do to invite this, right? So, um, you know, did you remember it correctly when I reported it to my immediate um, supervisor or, you know, in the military, uh, my platoon sergeant? And it was, what did, what did you do? Where were you? You know, and so it was, it was a hostile environment in terms of reporting it. So ultimately the way that I coped with it and I handled it was to really not pursue reporting any further because I was told, well, this will affect your career. And um, there were a lot of things that I experienced in the military as a result of this happening to me. Um, you know, I'm very hopeful because the military is taking a harder look at it, um, you know, as we're further into the future. And I'm, I'm hopeful that they're taking steps to really address it. And if there's anywhere um, that the military uh, or anywhere that restorative justice is really appropriate, it really is in the military because it's holding space for everyone. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a little bit about restorative justice and what that is later. Um, but, but that kind of brought me into the world of understanding what sexual harm was. Kind of fast forward um, further into my life and uh, lived experience, just like everyone, I'm a, I'm a person that has a lot of different experiences. I'm married, I have four children, and my husband was accused of a, a sexual offense. And subsequently, um, through the, you know, went through the system and was convicted of a sexual offense and is required to register. So when I look at this, um, what you would have, what I would have understood or believed 20 years ago and what I understand and believe now um, are very different because I can see it from a different perspective. So speaking about restorative justice, what does the organization you run do? I think that aligns really well with that question. Sure. Um, so Restorative Action Alliance is a regional group. We do work in New York and uh, Connecticut and New Jersey. And so really we focus on education, litigation and legislative advocacy. And we really are focused on building safer communities and investing in that primary prevention of sexual harm, because first and foremost, we want to stop that cycle. We focus on meaningful accountability, um, not carceral approaches, and we are very interested in safeguarding the civil liberties of everyone and holding space for everyone, even those who have caused harm. So we, we don't believe that systems of lifetime punishment and destruction like the public registry regime um, are effective. We feel that they're very counterproductive and um, they divert those valuable resources from proven services and programs that actually work to break cycles of violence. So that's what we do. We, um, we have some education programs. We have uh, restorative peer support circles where we bring people with shared lived experience, uh, people who may be registry impacted together um, in a circle group to support one another and hold space for one another. So, um, and then we do some, some litigation projects as well. We recently filed an amicus brief um, uh, when with uh, an organization that was seeking um, a, a writ from the Supreme Court. So a lot of different work going on there. 
Um, very grassroots. We were founded in 2020, the best year to start an organization. <laughs> um, and uh, people can find out more about it online on our website, which I'm sure we'll share later. Yes, yes. So the film itself, what were your, your response, I guess, in general, when you saw the film? So I have to say, I um, have been familiar the with the film since um, for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And my initial response to the film was that it was um, a really good look at the complexity of these issues. And it really focused really well on power structures and um, how the world of social science is really untethered from the world of like political um, and policy making and how it really humanizes people who are deemed as monsters while also having people understand um, what it means to have experienced harm. Um, it covers you know, the topic of child sexual abuse, but it also holds space for um, people as people and tries to break down those uh, barriers of you know, us and them. I'm really excited to actually be on the panel with Eric Janis because one of my favorite parts of the films uh, film is when he talks about, you know, the concept that we are, um, you know, exonerating ourselves as a society by saying, well, we'll put those monsters over there. And in, when in fact, the monsters are us, like it's an us, it's not a us and them. So, so I'm, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say this evening. <laughs> Well, not there yet. We want to continue to hear a lot more from you. <laughs> it's Eric. He's much more um, exciting than me. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it you think that allows you to see this issue differently than I think a lot of people who have that experience uh, see it as after that happens? So, I mean, again, a lot of people and myself included, I'm embarrassed to say, have the privilege of not having to think about what happens to someone after harm is caused and they're caught up in their own pain, which is um, absolutely justifiable. And I was caught up in my own pain for many years. So um, nobody can tell another survivor how they should handle or deal with um, what they've experienced. Um, when I experienced in my own family the impacts of the criminal legal system, it became very clear. And as I talked to other survivors who actually chose to go through the criminal legal system, that it was just harm piled upon harm. And what survivors had been promised as justice or healing um, turned out to be just, you know, arrested healing because they're being treated in a hostile way while going through the system and, um, you know, believing that somehow uh, the harm of another person or the destruction of another person was going to be healing for them. And um, that actually makes me angry as a survivor, that we're not centering the voices of survivors, we're centering punishment and pouring all these resources into that rather than trying to break the cycle. It's, it's really interesting your story, how it hits on both sides, the complexity of it. And I know it's always struck me on this issue and, and really in generally when it comes to the issue of you know, people that commit crimes and how they is handled in society. And some of these states are very similar even though they have different rules and laws is that you are looked at as a victim or a crime survivor, or you get empathy up until the moment you do something that is incredibly likely to happen because of something having happened to you when you were getting all the empathy. And so how do you think it plays with, you know, how we so quickly are going from people who get so much empathy on one side in the case of somebody who has been the victim of sexual assault, and then suddenly you're a monster that quick, and you deserve no understanding, no empathy. It's just the whole, this view changes completely. I mean, I, I think that it's human nature to try to categorize people. Like I find myself doing it, even though I'm highly like aware that we should not do that, right? And, and trauma really transfers, right? It's, it's um, about how we address trauma 
which is why it's so important to address trauma when it occurs and provide services and, and uh, opportunities for healing um, right away, rather than really delaying that. Um, and so it really is gonna, it's gonna affect those future outcomes. And so just as it would be wrong to excuse people's actions because they were previously victimized, like we still have to have accountability, it's also wrong to ignore somebody's victimization because they've harmed or they've been caught up in the system. So harm is harm, regardless of you know, what the outcomes be. And if we did a better job of addressing trauma when it occurs, rather than you know, kind of kicking it down the road or focusing solely on punishment, we would, we would start to break these cycles. Somebody asked a great question. What do you think was the defining moment for you when you started to change the way that you were viewing this issue and the experience and the whole, the overall? Hmm, that's hard. I mean, the defining moment for me, um, I, again, I think I'm ashamed to say was when it um, touched somebody and my entire family in a way that was so absolute. Um, so I'm sure we, we will talk about some of the collateral consequences of registration and incarceration and all of those things, but, um, it hit really close to home because someone that I love, whom I know is not a monster, got caught up in this system. And yeah. so it opened my eyes to the fact that, and then I started to learn, it opened my eyes to the fact that you know, there is no us and them, there is only us. And um, what it's my sincere hope is that it will not take that for other people to realize that's why I, um, you know, I'm open with my story. Yeah. I know there was a scene in the movie as well, where one of the women who was her job was her, her, you know, effort that she was really focused on was to track down people that were on the registry and get them for whatever reason, any little reason to get them sent back to prison. And her son got wrapped up in the system and it changed her view. And it's so it's very, very common. Speaking as somebody who was incarcerated, a lot of people who I met inside who had some view of the system like that. And then they get in there and they see just, you know, what's really going on and it quickly changes. So um, it is an interesting dynamic of human nature, how, how that is. It really is. And it's yeah. unfortunate. So with the messaging that you find that you use in this work, I would imagine it's, um, you have a specific point of strength when you talk about this issue versus other people, but you probably still run into a lot of difficulty. How do you message it? How do you find those conversations going when you talk to people? So, I mean, because I kind of have um, a lot of different ways that people label me, um, it, it's important to know the context in terms of who you're talking to. But at the end of the day, everybody can get behind the idea that what we're doing, if you really critically look at it and you look at the science of it and you look at the real lived experiences of both survivors and people who've committed harm, we're doing the wrong thing. Like we're not solving the problem and we're creating a lot of, um, you know, collateral damage to both people who are um, registered, people who are connected to people who are registered, as well as survivors. And we should really be um, angry that we're taking this approach because we're perpetuating cycles of sexual harm. And so, you know, the problem really is that our adversarial system is, does not create space for real accountability. So when you talk to people who've been victimized, and I can say for myself, um, what I wanted when I was victimized was for the harm to end, right? I wanted, I wanted to never experience that again. And then, you know, after, you know, I got through that, okay, I'm, a, I'm safe, you know, I can get through this. What I wanted to know is that it wouldn't happen to someone else. And so if the tools that we're using to do that are not doing that, and it, while also ignoring the needs of survivors for healing and ignoring the need for real accountability, what are we doing? We're not creating more safety. And, and so when, we, when I talk to people who have been victimized, that's what I talk to them about. 
Um, we don't want to be weaponizing and using the pain of survivors to um, decimate entire communities, to perpetuate racism, to perpetuate gender-based violence, and we're doing all of that with our current approaches. And as much as everyone is entitled to their personal pain and um, accountability for what happened to them, what they're not entitled to is to um, use that pain to create policies that decimate entire communities and uh, marginalize people and um, create more victims. No, that's, that's very powerful. I think for me, the three things that stood out in the movie the most were early on when they were speaking about the residency restrictions and they interviewed some legislator who was saying, you know, they're, they're out of here and they're not going to be here. And then the journalist is kind of really quietly just destroys that whole, you know, <laughs> claim of protection. This is where they go. So I don't know, they're not here. So you can't have a solution if it's just pushing it somewhere else. You know, putting your stuff in the closet is not the way of cleaning your house. And so that's exactly what we're doing in that case with residency, restri residency restrictions is just pushing them away. And so I thought that was very telling. And then later on, there was the scene where the daughter, who was the source of so much of what Ron Book was, you know, motivated by to get all of this fire and brimstone, uh, scorched earth, as was the term in the movie um, for Florida, for people that are on the registry, she got a master's degree and even says, you know, these policies actually really aren't helping. <laughs> we, we need to do something differently. And I think the cherry on top of all of it was the very end to speaking to what you were just talking about when uh, they even ask Ron Book, you know, would any of these policies have protected your daughter? And he says, no, most most of them would not have. I would argue none of them would have. And it's just very, very telling. <laughs> That's It's known, but we're still supporting these things. So I think that, um, you know, aligns powerfully to what you were saying. Um, well, that's the question I want to ask you about is something I find really important. It, it, it's very interesting because of the point of somebody who's system impacted, there's a lot of talk about the language that's used and you know what terms do we use and who, who accepts this and who accepts that. And there are terms like registrant, there are terms sex offenders by and large, I think you know going out of, um, for at least those of us that are in this work, not using that anymore. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to get out of that mental muscle of just using that term a lot of times. Um, but what are the, I guess, language that you run across that you generally use um, to refer to people that are on the registry? So, I mean, I think it's really important, the language that we use, and it is a conversation that, you know, people in the reform movement have and in different spaces and academia and all of that. Um, but, you know, people really can't be flattened to the worst thing that they've ever done. So I prefer, you know, person first language. So I might say, you know, person who's required to register, registered person, registry impacted, um, you know, and sometimes it gets difficult when you're, you know, writing in an academic setting, things get very lengthy, but um, it's definitely well worth it. Sometimes I may say person convicted of a sexual offense because knowing what we know about the system and how it disproportionately affects, you know, convictions and sentencings and, and accusations and how certain different people are seen as criminals, uh, you know, when they're not, um, mm -hmm. it's important to know that, you know, not everybody who is convicted of a sex offense may be guilty of a sex offense, but at the end of the day, you know, they've been caught up in the system. So there are a lot of different ways you can refer to people, but first and foremost, just like, I don't want everywhere I go for someone to say, that's a victim. I don't want people to say, I don't wanna be identified by that. I wanna be identified as a mother. I wanna be identified as an advocate, as a professional as you know, all of the wonderful things that I am, by the same token, we shouldn't be calling people what we don't want them to be and flattening them to a single conviction or moment in time, particularly if they've done the hard work that we've asked of them to, you know, in spite of a system that is destroying them, rehabilitate themselves and move forward with personal growth and understand why they did what they did and move forward past that, we should be assisting in that by supporting and holding space for them. Yeah, I had never heard of registry impacted. I like that a lot when you said it earlier. So uh, that would definitely be going in my uh, my my <laughs> dictionary of appropriate terms to use. 
And I know recently I was speaking to somebody who's involved in this work and she said that even registrant is one that, you know, she doesn't like. And I said, that's a good point actually, because it's, it's you know, it's it's semantics in a sense. It's very similar to sex offender. So yeah, um, I don't typically use that. And yeah. um, there was a time where a lot of people like to use the word registered citizen. Um, and there are individuals who are required to register who are not citizens and um, that can have a negative connotation for some people as well so I try to stay away from that as well yeah I, I would argue that none of us are really citizens after we have been convicted <laughs> of a crime because we're not <laughs> there's so many things taken away forever it's just the way it is speaking to your collateral con collateral consequences uh comment earlier well no I'm so so grateful for you to join us and you know that commentary is just so valuable to this and I think a lot of people listening um, it seems that some of the comments, you know, we're very grateful for um, some of the things that you were saying and affirming you know, the person first language and just generally, you know, the, the way this should be uh, viewed overall in society. Um, we go now to Eric Janice <laughs> as well. Thank you greatly for joining us. Um, you were in the movie, so you, you know better than anybody <laughs> a lot of things that are going on. How did you get into this work? Well, uh, I started my legal career as a legal aid lawyer, legal services lawyer in, in uh, Minnesota. And um, I almost by default began to represent people who had mental illness and specifically people who were being subjected to civil commitment uh, because they were severely mentally ill or thought to be severely mentally ill. So I became interested in that area of law, this kind of mental health law, civil commitment law. Uh, and then fast forward to the early 90s, um, I left legal aid, I began teaching. And um, there, th th this is the time when these laws that we're talking about, the registries and some of the other uh, related laws, specifically using mental health civil commitment against sex offenders, people who, who've been convicted of a sex offense in prison about to be released. And instead of being released, they are put into a so-called treatment, secure treatment program. Anyway, I became interested in that. I was, my sense of justice was offended by that. I thought it was a misuse of civil commitment. It was based on a, 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 essentially a, a bunch of non-truths. And so I, I became involved in, uh, in challenging the constitutionality of Minnesota's civil commitment law um, in the early 90s. And so that, that's how I became interested in this area. I began studying it and familiarizing myself with the um, social science as well as the legal uh, issues. Um, and then uh, three or four years ago, uh, got a, uh, a foundation grant to start a resource center to, to work with lawyers around the country who are challenging these post-conviction laws like registries, uh, residential restrictions, civil commitment, so forth. These are not based, they're, they're supposedly not punishment, but we know that they have a very punitive effect. But because they're labeled as not punishment, the state seems to have a lot of leeway in terms of the, the way they can treat people uh, that aren't protected by even those safeguards that are in the, in the criminal justice system. So that's a, a long way of, of, of talking about how I became involved. I think that's an interesting point that you mentioned about the way that the ex post facto clause is avoided because they're able to say these aren't actual punishments. Mm -hmm. These are whatever other terms they use. Yeah. It's very, it's a very powerful and very dangerous thing because here you are, uh, the state is obviously taking away people's liberty in, in these uh, registration laws. They're restricting where people can live, which is a pretty fundamental aspect of liberty. And then the civil commitment, they're actually locking people up all without any of the protections that normally go along with the deprivation of liberty. Why? Because they're called it's labeled as regulatory rather than punitive. And again, at least in my opinion, that's a very dangerous precedent because when is the state allowed to do that? When can the state say, oh, I'm gonna take away your liberty without these protections? The answer, if you're in some sort of a 
disfavored group, degraded group. And we know in the past in our society, we know who those degraded disfavored groups were. They were racial, they were sexual minorities, um, women for many, many years. Um, and now that concept remains alive because it's directed at the current group, the current out group, people who have uh, a conviction in the past for a sexual offense. Yeah. So the movie, what was your take of the movie overall? Did you feel like it did a good job of depicting the issue and in, in the complexities of it? I did. I thought it was masterful uh, in that regard because it, I mean, we know that um, these laws, for whatever reason, they strike very deep. There's a, there's a, a deep um, set of motivations involved in them. Um, and we know that there's a set of social science that's involved that we ought to be paying attention to because if we truly are, want to prevent sexual violence, we need to understand it and we need to understand where it comes from. We need to understand how we can intervene to get at the root causes of it. But on the other hand, we also know that this social science for a lot of people just kind of goes right over their head, that it's not very persuasive. And so the narratives of individual people become very important as well. And so I thought it was important in the movie that they, they focused on both the social science and the narratives of individuals from a variety of perspectives, both people who had been impacted by violence and people who had done harm to others. And there was an interesting point in the movie where uh, one of, I, I can't remember her name, but she was one of the um, experts they had on to speak about, um, you know, just the social science aspect of it and how she would share her papers or share, you know, the data sometimes with people that she knew and they would read it and they would just say, no, nah, I don't believe it. And so oh, it's yeah. just, what do you do with that? <laughs> <It's> like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I've, I've definitely experienced that. It's like, you know, I've testified at, at legislatures and okay, here, here's, the, here's what we know. This is what we've studied. There's a number of studies on this. And the, uh, you know, the response is, well, that's not what I read in the newspaper. You know, uh, I, I basically don't believe what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. So let's speak about some of the data from the movie. Then the data had, that was in the movie were mm, seven, 10, sometimes 20 years old. Um, what would you say to people who, because I had somebody ask me, is the recent data in line with that? Like it would have been nice to see more recent data. So does the more recent social science align with what was shown in the movie? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think we can kind of put it into a couple of different buckets. Um, clearly a lot of what the movie was addressing was uh, measured recidivism. Uh, and because we know that these laws actually are laser focused on recidivistic violence. And we sometimes think that that takes up the whole space. Well, recidivism, of course, we're worried about that. Um, but what's interesting to me to always keep in mind is that recidivism accounts for a very, very small percentage of all sexual violence. So when we laser focus on recidivism, we're really ignoring most of the harm that's being done to people. But to get back to your direct question, um, <laughs> one of the buckets, one of the, one of the pieces uh, or areas of social science was recidivism. And what is, was established, I think in the movie, still is true that the studies show that measured recidivism, and of course, this is recidivism that's detected, is much, much, much lower than was assumed by the courts and legislatures when they passed these laws. So it was assumed that uh, people who had been convicted of a sex offense and released from prison were almost certain to reoffend sexually. Turns out that's not the case. Now we can talk later about what do we do about the fact that a lot of sexual violence is unreported. Um, so, but that, um, that, social science definitely remains valid today. But there's, I think, been some very, very uh, significant social science that's been developed uh, kind of contemporaneously with the film and, and subsequently. And that is uh, the uh, social science that's taken a look at the effectiveness of the registry 
in terms of lowering the rate of sexual violence. And there we've seen a bunch of developments that confirm that um, the, the, there's, there's really no good evidence that the registry reduces recidivism. And there is some very provocative and I think solid statistical evidence that aggressive registry and notification schemes can actually increase recidivism. Um, and so that, that social science is, um, has been developing and uh, uh, I, I don't think, as I recall, I don't think that was really covered very, very extensively in the film. So the recidivism data point for me is generally problematic. I'm, I'm in the, I think a minority where I think that uh, recidivism data is fake news. I really think that it's over overwhelmingly used in a sense, it's uh, not supposed to be used. I think that we look at it as, you know, the be all and end all, and it's not even calculated accurately. And it's not even consistently calculated across the, uh, the country. And we did a podcast episode on that with a criminal justice professor um, for our podcast about last year. And I mean, yeah, there were some people who said they didn't know a lot of that that was on the podcast. So it, it's mm -hmm. something that I think is, um, whenever I hear that right away, if somebody says, oh, recidivism, I, I kind of, you know, <laughs> blank out. I don't want to hear any more of your conversation. Um, so I get that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious to know, why do you think it is then that this group, this demographic in particular has, which is found to be a lower recidivism rate to unfortunately bring that back up, than so many other categories of you know criminality. Well, what are some thoughts there? Why that might be the case? Yeah, you know, I, I, it's a really good question. You, you, you know, wrote to me that you wanted to ask me about it, so I've been thinking about it. Um, I, and I have to say, this is speculation. Um, uh, but here's here's what I think. Um, I think it's there are probably multiple reasons. One reason is that a certain amount of sexual offending, fair, you know, not a majority, but a certain amount is done by adolescents and, and young adults, college age people. They're still developing, you know, they're, they're developing. So, so you could say that a lot of it is kind of experimental or, or pushing or, or, or um, but the point is that those people grow up, they mature, they change. They understand that their behavior could be harmful. So I, I think that's one piece of it. Um, uh, um, but second of all, I think that unlike many other areas of criminality, I'm gonna go on a limb here and say this, unlike many other areas where, you know, people harm other people's rights or, or person do violence, um, sexual violence is very culturally specific. It's very, very embedded in our cultural values. And so I think that there are a lot of people who get mixed messages about what's permissible and what's actually desirable in terms of sexual relationships. These kind of, some people call it um, malicious masculinity or, or, you know, kind of ideas about what it takes to be a real man, for example. Um, and and we know that there are that, that um, there are mixed messages about that in our society about um, kind of what the proper relationship is between you know sexual partners. Um, and I think that if people get arrested and held accountable, that's kind of a clear message that um, actually you may have thought this was okay, but it's not okay. So uh, this, it, I don't know, I'm, I'm rambling here. I'm not sure that, I, that, that I'm making sense, but I do think that, um, uh, you know, why do we have these powerful institutions in our country, these universities, these athletic organizations, these religious organizations, where sexual violence against children in particular, and young people has been rampant? It's because the values of those organizations don't send a clear enough message that um, you know uh, sexual abuse is is unacceptable. When that message gets sent, a lot of people I think change their behavior. Yeah, I I think it's something where it leads to you know rambling because it's a very difficult 
you know, mm -hmm. the, I don't know if there is anything solid to say based off of it's very mm -hmm. anecdotal. I know for myself, having lived with and become friends with a very large number of people that um, ended up being on the registry or are on the registry, that there were, a, there was a certain set of structure to individuals that got locked up. They had jobs, they had pensions oftentimes, they had families that they can get out and they could segue back into some skill set or something they had. Whereas a lot of people that are incarcerated that mm. don't generally have that type of a crime, they were out doing a variety of things just to make mm. it, or mm. um, you know, they didn't have the stability to mm. return to or ever had it to know what it's like. Mm. That I think also is a big impact in when a person gets out that they can just seamlessly oh. flow back into society as a citizen just without that one thing they have to focus on yeah so it's just and of course that explanation then really really re-emphasizes the importance of re-entry and the importance <laughs> of not interfering with that right not yeah. interfering with those support systems the ability to have neighbors friends you know um both supporting you and holding you accountable yeah uh, absolutely so the underreporting you spoke about earlier, let's kind of touch on that. Um, yeah. It's it's interesting how I had read something um, recently that spoke about how it's difficult to say in this case that the recidivism rate is lower for those that are on the registry because so many sexual crimes are underreported. Um, so how does that bear with you know what you're seeing and, and how that's calculated? Yeah. Well, it it first of all, it's absolutely right that what we see reported about recidivism is observed recidivism. It's, you know, recidivism that has been reported to the authorities and that has led to either an arrest or to a conviction or incarceration. Um, and so there's a big attrition. We know that um, between actually experiencing sexual assault or sexual abuse and reporting it to the authorities and having the authorities take it seriously and investigate it and identify a, a, a suspect and make an arrest and a conviction, that, that's a big um, set, you know, those numbers go, go down fairly, mm -hmm. fairly steeply. Um, so, um, but a, a, a couple of thoughts about that. First of all, when we're talking about recidivism, we are always talking about people who have been reported and arrested and convicted in the past. So there's some reason to think that they will be reported, arrested, convicted more readily and more frequently and more regularly than people in the past who've not been reported. Mm. Um, you know, in other words, the 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 people who who've been caught in the past are going to be um, probably reported more readily. Police are going to be more, you know, quick to, to investigate and be suspicious of them. So there's a lot of reasons to think that the attrition rate for people on the registry, in a sense, is a lot uh, lower or less severe than for people not on the registry. Um, so that's number one. Number two, the point is, I, I would make, is that I mean, this is not a direct response to you, but there are a lot of people who are justifiably concerned about the fact that a lot of sexual violence is not reported and not investigated and not dealt with. Um, and Amber, I think, was, was talking about this, talking about the fact that for a lot of people, reporting it is a very traumatic experience. And so in my... <laughs> And, and, and so that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people are reluctant to report. And a second reason is that we have all of these collateral consequences so that if there's sexual violence, let's say within an acquaintance group or a family, and somebody wants to report it, they, they understand now that there's going to be, uh, if there's a conviction, there's going to be a registration requirement, and that's going to have collateral consequences on the family. So that's another disincentive to reporting. So um, I would say, yes, there's a lot of attrition, but having the registry actually is, uh, creates circumstances that actually make that reporting less likely. Finally, let me, let me just say one, one final thing about it. Um, these laws were never created because 
we had solid evidence about what recidivism was or wasn't, right? We know that. <laughs> um, but if there was a, 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 a you know, kind of a, a tip of the hat to, to the recidivism statistics, it was always in a comparative basis. So these laws were enacted because it was said that sex offenders, quote unquote, sex offenders are much more likely to reoffend than other offenders. Now it turns out that the science is completely otherwise. And now all of a sudden we're not supposed to use these statistics because um, you know, it turns out that those assumptions were, uh, aren't supported by, by the social science. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a powerful point of how the registry and the adversarial system that we have causes a lot of people to not be able to or want to report because the general policies we have are like one actual, if you could turn our policies into a human being, it'd be that person who, when somebody punches you in the head or runs away and then the policy is pointing to the wrong person, because we're focusing on people who are have a conviction record and are strangers when the real people are people that don't okay. have a conviction record and are really? close to you right now. Those Absolutely. are the ones that are the most likely to be, you know, the concern. Yes. So in doing that, you know, how do you report your, you know, brother or father or uncle? It's just so very difficult with the level of, right. um, you know, incentives and disincentives and pressures on you in that case. So yeah, it's just, it's not in line with human nature. It's counterproductive in so many That's uh, right. fantastic ways. Yes. Um, yeah. So this kind of goes to another part with the registry, and it was a point that was made in the movie that I, the one point in the movie that I am curious about and kind of question, but I'm not enough to know, and it was the point that the registry is okay if done in a certain way, if it's not made public, and if it's, you know, certain high class crimes, and we have a system where human nature starts to come in in a culture of punishment and of bias um, and so many other isms that are applied to the human beings that would be making those decisions, mm -hmm. even if it was a small group and not public, I still question whether that would be, you know, um, it might be better, but I still question whether that is in itself a good way to do it as well. And that's kind of the abolition mm -hmm. response or the question about the registry. So I'm curious what are your thoughts on, on that part of it? Yeah, well, I'm an abolitionist um, because I think that um, this is a Pandora's box. These laws are like Pandora's boxes. Once you get started on them, their natural tendency is to expand. Um, and they are all based on a fundamentally uh, dangerous idea that there's a group of people who are others who, um, you know, who, for whom the normal rights of a citizen don't, don't apply. Um, so I, 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 I'm an abolitionist. That said, um, I'm also practical, and I think, and I understand that there are, well, let me give you a, a good example here. I just was having a conversation with a, a lawyer um, who has done a lot of work on Guantanamo. And he said, you know, Guantanamo still exists, it has not been abolished but it's gone from 740 people, 750 people at its height to 40 people now. And that's been incremental and um, kind of below the radar. So I, um, you know, I also am practical and I think that if there could be changes that restored the registry to its original intent, this is kind of Patty Wetterling's uh, notion, right? The original intent was to assist law, law enforcement. It doesn't need to be public. All this public notification, all this other stuff is, is you know, putting kids on it, all that stuff. Um, that, that has come later. If it could be restored to its original intent, that would be progress. Um, on that point, can I just mention one, one other thing that I think is quite interesting? Because you asked about the state of social science. And so the question is, is, you know, some people will say, yeah, 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 I agree that it's public stuff is no good. But as a law enforcement tool, this is an important tool. And so it's interesting because there's almost no research about whether the registry actually helps law enforcement. 
in part for the reason you mentioned, which is that 95% of all reported sexual abuse is done by known people, not strangers. Um, but so now there's been one study that's looked at this statistically. And it's, it was, it's been done by a gentleman who works actually for the, United, for the Department of Justice and the Marshal Service. His finding, their finding in this study, which came out fairly recently, is that the registry, if it helps at all, only helps with stranger violence, which is very rare. And on average, a registry in, um, improves the closure rate by one day. So it, it is, it's a, it's a very, if it has a benefit, it's, yeah. a, it's a minuscule benefit. So, Interesting. Yeah. Well, my last question to you is about a uh, approach that we do at our organization called Correcting the Narrative. So I'm curious, what would be your thoughts on the way that we can, as this movie was trying to do, continue to correct the narrative about the registry and people on it um, in a, you know, a, a more full positive sense, which is what needs to be shown? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think that's really, really an important thing. Um, I think we have to have a, a two-pronged approach. I think we have to um, focus on, um, on the fact that the registry doesn't work, even for the purposes that it's claimed, that people claim for it, that it's expensive and that it detracts not only resources from real prevention, but it detracts our attention. And again, I'll, I'll go back to something that Amber referred to, and that is that the registry um, is a symbol for the fact, for the notion that that all we need to do is identify the bad people, put them over there, and we've done our job as a society. Instead of understanding that we need to change some fundamental ideas, notions in the society to prevent and reduce sexual violence. So. I, I, the all, all I, I don't think there's any magic way of doing it. I also think obviously that telling stories, I mean, my experience has been that when people hear the stories of real people who have been impacted by the registry, they they like say, well, oh, well, I didn't realize that. That's not what I intended. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but I'm paying attention to, to the, uh, to the framing issue and the language issue, because I think it's really important. So if we have any questions, I wanna to go to that part to see if, I think there was a lot going on in the chat. Um, I was not able to follow everything. Um, see one question is, uh, what are some alternatives we can look to, and this is for anybody, this isn't for uh, you necessarily, Robert. Um, what are some alternatives we can look to instead of incarceration to create accountability? It, you know, it depends how broadly you want to look. Um, I mean, certainly one alternative is to think about pre uh, prevention so that these things don't happen in the first place. Um, once the harm happens, um, there are some ideas like problem solving courts that combine um, some kind of accountability with treatment and, uh, and supervision. Um, and there's uh, a, a very successful approach known as um, circles of support and accountability um, that are COSA um, that uh, have been used in particular after, you know, on, on reentry to uh, and have been quite successful in supporting people who've been in prison and go back into the community. So those are those are just a couple of ideas, a couple of thoughts. So I, I'm going to jump in. I know I said Erica, go ahead, but I'm going to jump in as well. So um, we really need to ask different questions when harm occurs, and we need to ask questions not just of people who have committed harm, but also um, engage all of the stakeholders. And restorative justice is one way to do that. 
Um, so when you engage in restorative justice, you can utilize it, you know, as diversion from the system. Um, you can use it in place of the system. It's uh, jamming it into the criminal justice system is not super appropriate because they have two different uh, focuses. But restorative justice really asks, like, what harm has been caused and who has the responsibility to repair it? And what does the person who has been harmed need? Where the adversarial system is like, what statute was broken? How do we punish somebody? And it's not concerned with the victim at all. Um, I love the way Danielle Sered uh, kind of characterizes it. It's like, okay, somebody burned down my house and now I'm gonna burn down their house. But at the end of the day, everybody's homeless. Mm. Right. So so what are we doing? Um, so restorative justice is a really good way where you bring um, the person who's caused harm. You bring um, the person who has been victimized, who is really the center of the process. Um, it demands accountability and somebody to do things to make things as right as possible. It doesn't demand forgiveness. It also involves other stakeholders, like uh, you know maybe the family members of the person who has been harmed or community members. So it doesn't just put. Um, it, it starts to kind of break down those those systems and you know some of what Eric was talking about before, like it, some of the harm that is perpetrated is really as a result of mixed me messages, cultural norms patriarchy where you know when women are subordinate and men are you know supposed to be acting a certain way in order to be seen as a real man because that causes um a lack of reporting for men right like if a man a man has been harmed which happens they're less likely to report it and this happens a lot in terms of like the the you know lengthy childhood abuse where young men are harmed and they never report it because it seemed as it's seen as more shameful and it's a violation of their manhood. Mm. So those are the systems that we're not questioning with our criminal justice system. We're just saying, okay, individual perpetrators did this, we're going to punish them and, you know, it's going to be forever. So, so restorative justice is one way. It's not appropriate for everyone because if somebody can't be accountable for what they did, they're not appropriate for restorative justice. Um, so that is another way to look at it that um, it, I think is a little bit more productive. Yeah. I know um, what, what really is um, interesting is that there's so much sexual violence that occurs in society. It's just not spoken about outside of families usually or the two people that know about it and they, nobody speaks about it again. It's so like the underbelly almost of you know, our culture sometimes. And you, you, you know, how do you address that? I think being preventative is a very good approach. And I was, I was curious about the thoughts that you all have on what the daughter in the movie was doing at the end where she had a book where she was teaching about you know right correct touch and safe touch and all that in, in a child's book. Um, I thought, thought that was an interesting way of approaching it. It's very you know it was a little more it was a lot more preventative than the laws are actually. But it's curious if you think those kind of approaches, which I find kind of creative and you know a lot more um, preventative, are impactful or useful in this. I would say definitely. Um, you know, I'm not here to say that I agree with Lauren Book on many things. Um, or much of anything, uh, but prevention needs to start very early about how we interact with one another. So I think that is a positive way, but what we can't do is have our cake and eat it too mm -hmm. and say, okay, we're gonna continue to enact these laws and as a legislator act in one way and then promote you know, things on the other end. Because again, on that extreme side, we're perpetuating cycles while also saying we're trying to um, tear them down. So yes, that's a good approach, but it can't be in, in conjunction with these punitive approaches, in my opinion. There's a, a question that somebody had um, that was speaking about a comment that was on the Facebook page after the 
um, that they watched the movie. And it said, I watched the movie and I really haven't been swayed away from the sex registry. We will need all systems working from counseling to monitoring and education um, and the public and families. I want to know who's who around my neighborhood. I find that a very, very interesting thought because as human beings, we always think knowing something is going to protect us. But again, the point that I think is, is so powerful about uh, the facts of who's really, you know, the one to be concerned about and who's not is that you want to know who's in your neighborhood, but they're not the ones that are most likely to be a danger to you. And so it's like the point is being missed that you want to know something that's not really useful for you. I, I'm, I'm big on in the way I tell my story and why I try to tell the people to tell their story that our system impacted is don't tell people the exact crime that you have, the charge, because people don't know how to contextualize that. Um, it kind of goes to another level of bias where we say now in a society of okay, everybody's, you know, there's more inclusivity, you were in prison, okay, I'll accept that, but what were you in prison for? It's like, you're looking for another reason to be biased, just get past that, like move fully past that, and that's how we actually address what the issue is here. And so I, I thought that was a, it's a good question though. Um, is that something that you, uh, both of you run into, is there people watch it and they still feel like, you know, I'm, I'm imagining, it's still like, eh, I still want it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I just read uh, a couple of studies of uh, basically, uh, you know, the, the kind of social science term for these laws is crime control theater. Uh, <laughs> they are well, um, you know, there's a huge consensus among experts um, that they're ineffective. Um, and yet they have uh, great support among the community. So to me, what a comment like that indicates in part is, you know, some notion that I'm going to feel safer if I know who's around, but it's, you know, kind of a false safety because as you say, uh, I don't think it really increases your safety to know that three blocks away, there's a person with a conviction, um, at, you know, at all. Um, Fundamentally, under, underneath it all, I think what all of this reveals is that there's a punitive streak in our society and that the reason why this uh, kind of information, the social science that these things are ineffective doesn't change people's minds is because the, the, the purpose of these laws is not to be effective. The purpose of the laws is to punish people. Right. And to get people elected as well, I would say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if we have any more questions. I think that was uh, largely it. Um, I am greatly, greatly, again, um, grateful for all of you to come. Wait, hold on. I see. Wait, which types? Uh, well, there's a lot going on. I can't follow this. <laughs> it's <just> jumping around. <laughs> if you have any more questions, um, there has been, I know Amber dropped uh, her organization in the chat, um, our organization is in the chat as well. So if anybody wants to get the recording, um, you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. It'll be up uh, sometime soon. Um, just in general, follow the things that we're doing. So uh, our you know, social media, it's all, all the same stuff. We're everywhere, just like everybody else is. So <laughs> most anywhere you go, the basics. Um, but yeah, again, I, I greatly appreciate everybody joining. Um, I hope whoever can, can you know go out and uh, support for at least a day, for at least an hour, uh, the protest that Rob is doing to address, which I think is the lowest hanging fruit um, in this space of making a already current past law retroactive uh, and a consensual <laughs> charge. And yeah, I'm just very grateful for everybody that, that came out and uh, please spread the, you know, the word about the movie and, and this message to other people so they can challenge themselves on this issue. It's, a, it's an important issue and it's a microcosm of so many other larger issues in society. Thank you so much, Shannon. For Thank you very that. much for the opportunity and all yeah. the good work you're doing, Shannon. Yeah, I appreciate it. Take care. Night, everybody. Night.